my name is Andrea. I'm a librarian in Special Collections and Archives, um, and I'm going to be doing a present presentation today about Special Collections and Archives um, and doing research here at VCU and beyond VCU. Um, and throughout the presentation, if you have questions, you're welcome to drop them into the chat. Um, uh, like Kelsey mentioned in the chat, we are having some Wi-Fi issues, so I'm in a completely new setup today, so forgive me if this is a little bit clunky, um, and I will try and be mindful of the chat as we um, go forward. Okay, so. Okay, so special collections at archives at VCU and beyond. So really briefly, I'm just going to give a, a short description of what Special Collections and Archives is. I like to describe it as a library within a library. We essentially hold all the rare and unique materials within, um, well, here at VCU, within VCU Libraries Collections, but that will be common across many different Special Collections that you go to. Um, special Collections focus typically on primary sources, um, and primary sources are materials of firsthand creation. Um, so usually they contain eyewitness accounts or information documenting a topic firsthand, um, and they don't include inter usually don't include intermediary um, interpretation of materials. So there's a wide, wide range of materials that would fall within primary sources, um, the definition of primary sources. But usually in archives and special collections, you'll find things like newspapers, correspondence or letters, photographs, oral histories. Um, here at VCU, we have a, an actually fairly large art collection, um, and you'll also sometimes find artifacts within primary sources. So we have a wide range of materials, and most special collections and archives that you go to will have a wide range of materials, um, from books to periodicals to archival materials or historic documentation. Um, here at VCU, if you're interested in finding books or periodicals within uh, our collections, um, you, you can use the VCU search. So I have a link here, um, and these slides will be sent out to you. Um, but this essentially will take you to, let's see. the homepage of VCU libraries. So this is specifically the search, the search box, but this is the same as the um, yellow search box on the homepage of VCU libraries uh, website. Um, and you can do search keyword searching. Um, this is a little bit strange because it's almost backwards searching. So typically when you're um, looking for materials, it's not that you're necessarily looking for materials only in special collections and archives, you're looking for materials across the collections, but I'm going to show you how you would limit your search results to what we have in special collections and archives. Um, and here at VCU, it's a little bit confusing because we have two different locations. We have um, James Branch Cabell Special Collections and Archives, and we have the Health Sciences Library Special Collections and Archives. Um, there are essentially two distinct collections, but um, all of the searching for those collections can be done in the VCU search. So I'm going to click here and just do a search for the word space. And as you can see on the screen, um, there are 5.3 million results. Um, we certainly don't have 5.3 million results, um, materials within special collections that are related to space. So the way that you would find materials specifically in special collections and archives um, would be to use the facets or the filter my results bar. Um, and I find that the best way to do this is to go to the location. So you'll scroll, scroll down on filter my results and you will find a location tab. Um, now, this is also very confusing, um, but you will find that there are locations for special collections and archives. But as I mentioned, we have the Health Sciences Library Special Collections and Archives. We have the James Branch Cabell Special Collections and Archives. Um, and within those special collections and archives, there are specified separate locations. So my best advice to people doing searching at VCU for special collections and archives materials is to, to select all of the locations possible that are listed as special collections. So you can see over here on the side in the facets under location, if your search term 
at uh, returned items within special collections. If you look on the side here, um, you can see Cabell Library Special Collections and Archives. So you would click that, you can continue scrolling down and you'll wanna just um, scan here to see if Special Collections and Archives shows up any other places. So you can see here, we have Cabell Library Special Collections and Archives Book Art. So I would also select that. Um, if you continue to scroll down, we have Comic Arts. You might also see that it would say Health Sciences Library Special Collections and Archives. And if we go back um, to the slide, oops, you can, I've listed all of the different um, feasible locations within Special Collections and Archives. So you could see Special Cabell Library, Special Collections and Archives, and then it would be Reference, Cabell Room, Comic Books, Book Art, and Oversize. Those are essentially sub-locations within Special Collections. And for the Health Sciences Library, you might get this general Health Sciences Library, Special Collections and Archives, but you might also get reference materials within the Special Collections. Um, I'm just going to go back and apply these filters. I didn't, I didn't select this last one. And you can see now all of the results that you have, there are much fewer um, results, will be within special collections and archives. Um, so then you could go th comb through and see what the items we have within our collections are. Again, this is probably not how you're going to be searching. I, I think you'll likely be doing keyword searching or title searching or topic searching, um, and things might fall into special collections and archives, and they might be of interest, in which case you could come visit us. Um, but if you did want to actively just search in special collections, that's how you would do it. Okay. So what do archival materials look like? Um, Archival materials really um, can range uh, and they look quite different at different places, but there is a standard way that most paper materials um, are housed in special collections. So I'm going to stop sh screen sharing. And if you take a look here, most archival materials are housed in boxes that look like this. This is what we call a document box. There's a label on the front here. And within the document, I'm trying to, <laughs> within the document boxes, if you open them up, there will be many, many folders. And each of these folders holds at least one document. Usually it's not, well, it's not unusual to find that each folder holds more than one document. Um, so it might be a cluster uh, of different papers inside each folder. But this is typically what you'll find with um, paper materials within archives. Um, and this, if you go to do archival research, you'll typically get delivered either one of these boxes, if you've requested materials in the box, or at some, at some repositories, you might only be um, delivered one folder at a time. And once you're done with one folder, they'll deliver it to you the next folder. So now that we know what an archival collection looks like, um, how do we find these materials and how do we understand what's actually in the collection? So I'm going to need to share my screen again. So um, archival collections typically are, um, all have something called a finding aid or a collection guide attached to them. So when we're do uh, when materials are donated to us, essentially that's how we get most archival materials is that people or organizations will give us their materials. Um, there is someone called a processing archivist that will go through those materials and organize and arrange them in a way that would, that hopefully makes them more accessible to researchers. Um, and that organization will then be shown in what we call a finding aid. And a finding aid or collection guide is exactly what it sounds like. It'll give you an overview of what's in the collection. It'll tell you how the collection is organized so you can see what's in the folders, what's in the boxes. Um, and an example of that within our collections are the Larry Levis papers. 
So this is typically what a finding aid or collection guide will look like. You'll see the, the name of the collection at the top. Usually collections have um, at different repositories specific numbers that are attached to them and the specific identifier. Um, but in a typical collection guide, you'll have um, these main elements. So the first element that you'll usually see is something called the scope and contents. Um, and that will describe to you what's in the collection um, and typically how the collection is like generally organized. So collections usually are, in order to provide access, are divided up into different series. And series, sometimes you'll see at the beginning, there'll be like a biographical series. Uh, there's usually a correspondence series in which all the correspondence are grouped, um, correspondence within the collection are grouped within that series. Um, and you might see uh, different types of series based on what the materials were and what the sort of natural grouping within those materials were. And again, that is up to usually a processing archivist, the person who's going to be arranging and describing the materials to determine what that um, arrangement is, what the, what the series are. Um, and that person, because they've gone through the entire collection, generally has a good overview of what's in there. So they will have written the scope and contents to indicate to you what's in the materials. What you'll also usually see are the dates um, of the materials within the collection. So it's not the dates of um, the lifespan of the person that the papers might be from or the organization, it's the, the dates of only the materials within the collection. Another important part for researchers especially um, are access and use restrictions. So typically, Collections or archives will not, uh, not accept materials that we can't provide access to. Um, we are here to save materials and to make sure that they're available to researchers. So if someone donates materials and tells us, I don't want anyone to ever access these materials, um, it, it's a hard argument for us to retain them if no one is ever going to ever be able to use them. But Sometimes you'll have minor restrictions, like there might be one or two folders within a collection that might have personal information or for whatever reason, the donors don't want that shared. Um, or the processing archivist has deemed that there's um, information that uh, does not need to be shared with the public. Um, and you will see in under the access re restrictions if there are any of those items within the collection. The use restrictions are for publication, or reproduction of things within the collection. So you'll usually see a copyright statement here um, if there are particular things that you might need to do in order to get um, permission to reproduce or use the site, the materials within the collection um, for publication. And then the last sort of major area of the finding aid, the front matter of finding aid is the biographical historical note. So it's exactly what it sounds like that'll give you background information if the processing archivist has any um, on the person whose collection it is or on the organization whose records um, we hold. Uh, again, sometimes the biographical note will be um, relatively long and we'll have a lot of information. The processing archivist will have gathered a lot of information about that person or organization through processing those papers. Um, and sometimes there might not be a lot of information. So sometimes there might even be no information, but I've seen a lot of biographical and historical notes that are just one sentence because that's all that's known about the background of that collection, um, background of that person or organization. Um, and then the, uh, the extents, um, I, I probably is not going to be too relevant to you as a researcher, but that will give you a sense of how big the collection is. So we tend to measure things in special collections and archives by linear feet. Um, so what that means is I, that box I showed you earlier, I think the boxes are six inches. So, um, you know, one linear foot would be two boxes and you can see the extent. So this is a 7.3, looks like linear foot collection. So it's a relatively large collection. Okay, so now that you know about the background of the collection, um, the collection organization is also going to be probably one of the more important things that you're going to use within searching um, archival materials. So you can see here, you can access this in this program archive space, um, which is what VCU uses and what many, many repositories use now um, as a system or program for organizing information. You can click here, 
collection organization, it will give you, again, the scope and contents at the top, just to kind of reorient you as to where you're looking. And then it will start giving you a listing of what the series that we have and then what's within those series. You can see that that also corresponds to the screen over here um, in which you can see the series and then you can see all of the elements within the series. Now in this case and in most cases, um, these, these listings within the series are corresponding to individual folders within, within those boxes. So that box that I showed you earlier is actually from the Larry Levis papers. It is the first box in the Larry Levis papers. So that first folder um, is the folder that you see, is the listing that you see here. But again, this is just giving you general information about what's in the collection. Um, in the case of correspondence, um, you can pretty much bet that the, course, the, the, the folder that you're seeing here is going to be correspondence between the person whose collection it is um, and the person listed on the folder. Um, one thing to note though here is that um, it's unclear whether it's one document or multiple documents. So you can see here, um, like in this American Poetry Review folder, there's a range of dates. So that's likely going to indicate that there's multiple pieces of correspondence, but we don't generally do not list things on an item level description. So you're getting a general idea of what's in a folder, but you're not getting specifics about every single item within a folder. So as a researcher, that's something to keep in mind. Um, you oftentimes will only be, the finding aid will only give you an idea of what's in the collection. Um, but as a researcher, it's up to you to go to the collection and actually see what the specific contents are and if there are contents that are um, of interest to you um, and your research. So this collection, you can see the Larry Levis papers is comp composed of eight series. Um, and if you were to expand each of these, you would see all of the sub sort of series or sub um, groupings within these series um, that the processing archivists, as they were looking through the materials, grouped the materials um, in, into these different areas. And again, most of the time, this is going to be um, course, it will correspond to folders, individual folders um, within those boxes in the collection. Um, and this is, of slightly less importance, but I showed you the boxes, the box earlier with the folders. Um, Archive Space will also give you a container inventory. So you can, you, I, I don't think that this will be super helpful, but you could look through each box. So if I were to pull up box one, um, so this is corresponding to the physical box, um, you can see all the folders listed that fit or fit within that box. Again, I think it's going to be much more helpful to look at the collection organization um, and identify materials based on their, their headings and the titles of the folders rather than um, working backwards and working from the boxes. Um, and one thing that's a little bit confusing is that when you um, choose, if you, if you say you were to come to this collection and you found things that you wanted to look at more closely, uh, what you would typically do is contact the repository um, that holds those materials and say, I've been looking at the finding aid for the Larry Levis papers, um, and I see that there are, um, in this case, sub-series, that there are a couple of items, and you would give maybe a couple of these titles that I'm interested in looking at. Um, and that usually will suffice for the repository to be able to pull the right boxes and right folders for you to look at. Sometimes they will ask you what box um, that material is in, in which case you can click here um, and it will give you the box and also the folder number. Um, but usually it should suffice just to say the titles of the folders that you're interested in, or even sometimes if you're interested in an entire series, you can request to see an entire series. Different repositories operate in different ways in terms of the things that they will allow you to request and how they want you to request things. Um, and they generally will make it clear um, or they should make it clear about how they um, need you to, to, to give um, information about what you would like to see. And they are usually hopefully friendly enough that they can explain or sit, um, walk you through the process um, if it is unfamiliar to you. 
All right. So we went over finding aids. They have the collection overview. They have the collection organization. Um, and that organization usually means that there are series and sub-series um, with the, uh, how the archival material is arranged. So now that we know what an archival collection looks like um, and how it is described and arranged, um, how do you find materials? So uh, I mentioned before that we have archive space. That is the program that we use. To, essentially, it's a database that holds all of our finding aids that describe um, the different resources, archival resources that we have. And here at VCU, we use archive space, um, but it is very, very common among most academic rep repositories and even non-academic repositories. So um, sometimes museum repositories will use it or historical societies will use archive space. Um, but the thing to keep in mind with it is archive space click through here. Um, this is the main search screen for our archive space. So um, it, this is where you would start your search. So if I were looking for the Larry Levis papers, I would do Levis. And you would click through to here. Um, so most repositories, again, will be using archive space, um, but um, regardless of whether you're, the repositories are using archive space or not, they should all have some form of listing their finding aids or collection guides. There are some really sort of older um, collections that have not yet moved online. So sometimes you'll find places that have um, only paper finding aids. Um, so they'll have to scan the finding aid and then send it to you in order for you to see what the contents of the collections are. But again, um, archive space is pretty common um, and it's, it's really nice because the finding aids are all online and you can do the searching through, um, through the computer prior to going to a repository. There are a couple other resources if you're searching um, specifically within the Virginia, so Virginia and West Virginia, there's something called Virginia Heritage. And again, all of these links will be sent out to you um, with this presentation. And this is what we would call a consolidated database. So essentially what's happening in this program is that when you do searching, and again, that can be keyword searching, or if you know particular people, you can put them in that search box. It'll be searching finding aids across multiple institutions um, within Virginia and West Virginia. Um, and I don't recall how many institutions are within Virginia Heritage. Um, but it's quite a few. So um, these are really, this is really nice because um, it typically when you're doing archival research, you want to search as widely as possible because there are, there could be materials scattered all over the place um, in terms of what might be relevant to you. Um, and it's not um, unusual for, you know, say there's one person who you're looking for, it's not unusual for their papers to be located at multiple repositories. So um, say you were looking for, let's go back to Larry Levis. Um, he has papers here, but he also might have papers um, at UVA, or he might have papers at the University of Iowa. It depends on um, where he decided to donate his materials or his estate decided to donate his materials. Um, but you can imagine also that if he participated in correspondence, um, we might have the correspondence that he received, but he would have sent correspondence and that might be located in someone else's um, uh, collection, someone else's personal papers that might be held at a different repository. So um, part, of the, part of the hard part, but also part of the exciting part of doing archival research is that it can be rather um, expansive and you can go down quite a few rabbit holes um, and you, it might take you on a journey across the country, internationally, you just never know where materials might pop up. So, of course, if you're looking for people who are not associated with Virginia or have not donated their materials to an institution in the Virginias, um, there is another resource available called Archive Grid. Um, and Archive Grid is put out by the same people who do WorldCat. Um, so essentially, Archive Grid is a much larger consolidated resource. So it is searching among mostly 
domestic, but also international repositories. So you can see here, this is just zoomed in to where we are, um, but each of these pins represents um, a repository that has put essentially their finding aids into archive grid. So when you do a search here, you're searching across essentially, and I'm gonna try and zoom out here sometimes because there's so many repositories that are represented in archives grid, this can be a little bit sluggish. But you can see here just within the United States, and I don't think it's gonna let me drag, um, how many repositories you would be searching, how many finding aids you would be um, searching at these different repositories by doing a search here. So I think for uh, most people doing archival research, um, you, usually at the, you know, at, at the graduate level, even undergraduate level, um, typically are not just looking at things that are locally immediately around them. So if you're here at VCU um, and in Richmond um, and want to do searching that is beyond VCU and beyond Richmond, Archive Grid is a pretty good place to start. And then lastly, um, a lot of people, especially nowadays, are looking for digitized materials. Um, and the thing to keep in mind with digitized materials is that most archival collections, I think the majority, I don't think the majority of materials have not been digitized. So um, there are a lot of paper based collections. Most of those things have not been digitized, but a great deal of materials have been digitized. And so there will be digital, what we call digital sur surrogates available. Um, and increasingly there are born digital materials. So those materials that are say emails or um, even word documents um, that never had a paper based um, form. Um, so if you are interested in doing searching for those digital surrogates or sometimes those born digital materials, um, there are a few places that I can recommend to go to. So the first one um, here at VCU, we have digital collections. I'm not going to click through to each of these um, resources, but I definitely recommend that you go through. Um, there's some really interesting material out there. The other places that I'll recommend um, for wider searching beyond VCU is the um, DPLA or the Digital Public Library of America. Um, that again is it's like a consolidated search. So it's searching pretty widely um, through collections. And then the Library of Congress Digital Collections is, is pretty excellent as well. So those are good places to just get started. Um, but a lot of times <laughs> digitized materials are held in sort of separate locations at each repository. So VCU Digital Collections is like our own essentially homegrown system. Um, so if uh, this is odd for me to say as a librarian, but um, oftentimes Google is a good place to start um, because it will lead you to those specific repositories that maybe not are not participating in those um, uh, consolidated resources. And then the last way to locate archival materials, and I think sometimes the best way to locate archival materials is to contact the special collections and archival staff um, at different institutions. And the reason that I recommend that is you might find that there's a repository that it seems like they have a lot of materials that are related to what you're interested in. Um, but if you contact the archival staff, they usually have some good insight into what collections, if, they, um, if you tell them about your research, they have good insight into the collections you might want to look at or knowledge about other collections or other repositories that might be useful um, and other digitized materials that might be useful to you. So I, it is, I think, always a good idea to contact special collections and archival staff um, to see if there might be materials out there of interest. And even if you're here at VCU, and I know I work at VCU, I work at our special collections and archives. If you are doing something that you know essentially doesn't have anything to do with Virginia, doesn't have to do with Richmond, doesn't have to do with VCU, please get in touch with me. I would be happy to meet with you to help you kind of get pointed in the right direction um, and start your search. Um, even if it doesn't have to do with our collections that we have here, I can kind of walk you through the process and do um, individual research consultations. So there are a couple additional resources that I can recommend. The Society of American Archivists, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's a bunch of archivists, um, have made something called Using Archives, a Guide to Effective Research. It essentially recaps everything that I've talked about and goes more in depth. So um, it is a PDF and it's also a website. So if you were to click through to this link, um, it would take you to that. 
Um, and again, I think it's like 15 pages um, of step-by-step -step how you do archival research. Um, and then the, the last resource that I will recommend um, is the LibGuide that we have um, for primary source research. So it's a little bit buried in the website, but I've given um, the breadcrumbs to get to it, but I will just show it to you all today. And it also will recap everything that I talked about. And it is a little bit more VCU specific. So um, here um, it will tell you about finding resources within VCU special collections. Um, but there is a page for researching beyond VCU as well. And then one other element of this page um, will give you uh, how we or our suggestions for how to handle materials, um, how to request materials, and also what we um, what our guidelines are for a reading room. Because when you go to different repositories, it's typical that you'll have to wash your hands, you're not allowed to use pens, you can't have food or drink. Um, so it's typical that there will be some set of rules that you will have to adhere to, and it's always good to know those ahead of time. Um, but that is also something that you can ask um, the archivist um, about if you're interested in looking at materials within that collection. And I, and I realize that I'm talking about asking the archivist, it's typical also that if you ever find materials um, within a collection, you will have to email or contact the repository in order to see those materials. Um, and that will start the conversation with the archivist about um, what they might require in order to come do research. And I think lastly, before we move to the end, um, one thing to keep in mind, I think, for a lot of researchers is that, as I mentioned before, materials are going to be scattered all over the place. And it's um, and those descriptions and the finding aid that we have of the materials aren't item level. So sometimes you might be doing research and you see something and you're like, that seems like it might be of interest, but I'm not sure. Contact that repository. Um, and they are likely going to be willing to do some level of cursory search within the collection to find things to see if there are things that might be relevant to your research. So you would contact them, say, I'm doing research on this topic and I saw this folder, I saw this collection, and I was wondering if you knew if there are any materials in the collection um, or if you can check this folder to see if there are materials that might be relevant to my research. Again, most places will do some level of cursory um, searching for you. And if the thing that you're requesting, the amount of research that you're requesting is maybe too, um, too expansive, a lot of times what they will recommend to you, and this is something that we do at BCU, is we'll recommend that you hire an independent researcher to go to that repository if you're remote, if you can't get to the repository. Um, to do research on your behalf. So you would independently hire them. Here at BCU, we have Handshake, um, and that is that radiates out to the BCU community. Um, students oftentimes are hired to come in and do research um, for people who can't come in themselves. Um, and so it's not unusual to have that happen, but it depends from um, repository to repository. So sometimes they will do a great deal of uh, research for you. So it's always good to ask. Um, and then they will walk you through that if, um, if you do need to hire someone independently to do that searching. So that I think is um, in a very consolidated time period, um, searching in both special collections, books and periodicals, but also with archival materials. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, are there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. I had a question, Andrea. So right. if, let's say, an independent researcher is, is not necessarily oh, something. I hear you, and I don't know oh, how to. Oh, no. Okay, I, th I think maybe I'll be... How about now? Yes, I hear you a little okay, bit. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this has been a challenging webinar. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, so if an independent researcher isn't something that you have the means to, uh, you know, pay for, um, is it common for them to be able to scan something if you know you need it? Or, you know, what kind of, how far will they go to to help you if if 
I could ask that. <laughs> yep, that's a great question. Um, th again, that's going to change from repository to repository. So um, here at VCU, again, we like we we pretty much determine things on a case by case basis. So uh, we will usually scan like around. 10 to 20 pages for a researcher, sometimes, especially, you know, the pandemic hasn't been good for very many things, but I would say that because of the pandemic, repositories are more likely to do more scanning and more digitization for researchers than they were before. So um, because it's harder to get to places, um, the, the amount of scanning that places will do for people is, is a little bit higher. But I think some places have like standard policies. So um, some places you can request as many copies as you want, but they will charge for those copies. At VCU, we don't charge for any reproductions, but we will only do, you know, again, it's case by case basis, but usually 10 to 20 pages of reproductions or scanning or photocopying for researchers. Um, but it is really hard to answer from place to place what they'll do. Um, but it isn't unusual to see also places that say like, we will make as many copies as you like, and it'll be 10 cents a copy or whatever, whatever. Or sometimes they'll do like, we'll do up to 50 copies for free and beyond that, you'll have to pay a little bit additional money, but it's certainly cheaper than hiring someone and it's cheaper than flying to or physically getting to that collection. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I'm also, I'm gonna sh share my screen just one more time. Um, if you have questions, uh, this is the best way to get in touch. So uh, either one, it's so confusing because we have two different locations, but essentially if you're not sure which location is relevant to your search, it doesn't matter email either one of them and we will get back to you or we will direct you to the right person. Um, but you can also always get in touch with me. This is my email address. Uh, I'm also on the VCU Libraries website and I believe uh, my contact information will go out with the recording should you, um, should you want to get in touch with me. But again, I am very happy to talk to you um, about doing research, regardless of whether you think your research has anything to do with VCU's collections or with Richmond or with, with Virginia. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing from you, hopefully. Um, but thank you so much for attending. And um, I hope that this made searching a little bit clearer in Special Collections and Archives. Um, but again, thanks for joining me on this beautiful day. And thank you for bearing with me as I tried to figure out um, how to operate on this computer. <laughs> <laughs>